Well, it's wonderful to be here with you, Dr. Chamberlain. My name is Cece Doucette from Ashland, Massachusetts. I help my public school district become the first in the nation to start taking precautions around wireless technology. And I was so delighted when New Hampshire's representative Patrick Abrami wrote a bill to start investigating the health and environmental impact of 5G or fifth generation technology. And given that you served on that commission as a member of academia, uh, I am just honored to be with you here today to talk about the report that came out from that commission's investigation. So Dr. Chamberlain, can you please tell us a bit about your background? Well, I have been, I'm, I'm retired now, uh, but when I joined the commission, I was the chair of the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. My specialty area has been electromagnetics. So I've done both computer modeling of electromagnetic fields and its interactions with things, with uh, obstacles. So I, I've been involved with electromagnetics my whole career. And frankly, when I came onto the commission, I, I mean, being an advocate of technology, being somebody familiar with the, how the, the technology works and seeing the opportunities it might provide, I thought this would be a, to use a, a colloquial term, a slam dunk that would find that there's no problem with it and that we would simply move forward. So that's the bias that I came onto the commission having. Yeah, and I was the same when an electrical engineer friend of mine mentioned there could be biological effects. I certainly didn't want to hear it because I spent eight years bringing this technology into my public schools. Right. Um, but then I understand that New Hampshire passed this law that asked a commission be formed and investigate a certain set of questions. Can you walk us through who was appointed to that commission and why? Uh, certainly. It was the, I should note that this was not just some random commission formed by a governor. It, it went through the full legislative process. So a constituent uh, reported uh, concerns about exposure. We had uh, Representative Pat Brahmi, as you just mentioned, who became knowledgeable about some of the issues and then wrote the legislation that was very specific about what a commission should do. That legislation got passed by the legislator, legislature, got signed by the governor. So this is an example of, of when the legislation or legislative process works correctly. So what was specified in that legislation that was approved in a bipartisan manner, and I should also note that uh, Representative Abrami is a Republican, mm -hmm. but it specified very clearly who had to be or who was, was to be on the commission. Uh, two state senators, three representatives, somebody from the attorney general's office, somebody from health and human services, mm -hmm. uh, two representatives from the high tech council, representation from the Business and Industries Association, uh, somebody from the New Hampshire Medical uh, Society, and then somebody with background from the university, as you mentioned, with a background in radio frequencies. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's who was on the commission. Yeah, and I believe that a couple of them were medical doctors as well. Is that, that correct? That's right. Uh, two of them were. Yeah. And so, uh, and they added a lot with their medical yeah. expertise. Right. And you had one of the world's leading radio frequency scientists, uh, Dr. Paul Haru from McGill University, right? Absolutely. So in yeah. the end, we, we, we got 13 members with, uh, as, as you note, and as I noted, uh, you got backgrounds that include physics, engineering, electromagnetics, epidemiology, biostatistics, occupational health, toxicology, mm -hmm. medicine, public health, policy, and uh, business and law. My gosh. We, so we really had a, a great group of people with expertise expertise sufficient to explore the problem that we were tasked to explore. Right. So with that, can you walk us through, I understand the bill had a set of questions in it that the commission was tasked with investigating and reporting out on. Yeah, we sure did. Um, and I'll just I'll give some of the highlights because it did have a, a fairly long list of questions that we were supposed to address. Uh, one of them was, why the insurance industry recognizes wireless radiation as a leading risk, health risk, and it, uh, it, it why the, the industry, the insurance industry won't do anything about, won't provide insurance for exposure to radiation. Not even Lloyd's of London, and they'll insure almost anything, but this one's too risky for them, so they won't even touch it. So that was one of the questions. And also, why have the thousands of peer-reviewed studies that show harm from radiation, why are they being ignored by the FCC? 
So those are some of the questions that we were asked to address. Yeah, that's wonderful. So for those who are just joining the conversation on the potential risks from today's wireless technology, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to take a moment just to kind of get our heads around what this invisible potential toxin is that we're talking about. So for example, I have a cell phone. It's, it's an old hand-me-down from my husband. <laughs> I keep it in airplane mode as a rule because I don't want to be exposed to this radio frequency unless it's an emergency. Um, so what I'd like to do is show in my home, we have chosen to use the safer version of technology, which happens to be a lot faster and a lot more reliable. And that just goes back to hardwiring with an ethernet cable. So it's not rocket science to fix this, right? So, but watch what happens when I take my cell phone out of airplane mode. And this radio frequency detection meter is picking up the signals from the five or six separate antennas that are in this one device now, my cell phone. And although this is invisible to you and I, our cells feel this all the time. So that's why we're concerned about this. And with 5G, we'll be adding on an extra layer of radio frequency radiation because the signals that we're using to send our our 4G and 3G, that just means generations. The way we send those back and forth today, all that infrastructure is staying in order for 5G to fly. They wanna put antennas every two to 12 houses right outside our homes at the curb, so at close range. So 5G is a whole game changer. Um, so if we can talk a little bit about you know, how you approach this study, what kind of experts you brought in to speak, then I think that would give the public a general idea of the magnitude of intelligence we have around this if we can just get the information to the public. Yeah, and that is kind of a surprise, it was a surprise for me when I first came to looking at this issue. And that is that there's been a lot of work and there are a lot of people out there who have studied the problem. Uh, for example, we brought in uh, Paul Uru, who you mentioned, who's a professor of toxicology at the McGill University and his specialty is toxicology involving exposure to electromagnetic fields. Yeah. Dr. My Michael Wide, he's the, from the National Toxicology Program at the NIH, the top level people who have studied this. Matter of fact, it was the toxicology program that labeled exposure to electromagnetic fields as a, a carcinogen. Mm -hmm. Also, I uh, have uh, Timothy uh, Shridey. I don't uh, Shackley. Shackley. <laughs> Dr. Timothy Sheckley. <laughs> Sheckley, thank you. Uh, senior research fellow at University of Colorado. He's been studying this issue for years. And uh, they, uh, Dr. David Carpenter, all of these guys have PhDs or MDs. Uh, actually, David Carpenter's got his MD. But he's from, uh, he's the director of the Institute for Health and Environmental Studies at the University of Albany. So, yeah, and he has been a longtime collaborator with the World Health Organization. So right, good point. Please go to the top of the house. Right. So uh, top level people. And we also brought in somebody or no, we didn't. The telecommunications uh, uh, industry, uh, CTIA, brought in somebody you know, as our only paid presenter, but somebody from the University of Pittsburgh who claimed that there was no problem with exposure to electromagnetic fields. So yeah, I've seen Dr. Swanson speak before, but we also had uh, Dr. Deborah Davis, who's a Nobel Peace Prize co-laureate on climate change. She right. runs the, or founded the Environmental Health Trust, and then her executive director, Theodora Scarato, has built an incredible database of what is happening here in the U.S. and what other countries are doing to address this. So, yeah, you were really able to hear from some top level leaders on this. Right. <clears throat> well, that's terrific. So when you finished your investigation or the commission's investigation, you put out a report that's 390 pages long. <laughs> and when I first saw it, I went, oh, 390 pages, that's going to scare off a lot of people. But I remember from the meetings, because you guys had an open, transparent process in which the public was invited to attend your meetings with the commission. And I thought that was brilliant because this is the first time ever we have brought together the legislature, the scientific community, 
and the industry to finally talk through this and see what's going on. So when I looked at that 390 page report, I thought it was brilliant that Representative Abrami suggested that we do a majority report and it's only the first 17 pages of the document. So it's really not hard to read, right? And then there's a minority report. Can you help us understand? Cause I don't think every state does that. And I think those majority and minority report terms might be new to some folks. Okay, well, to the best I understand it, for any commission report, there's an opportunity for, for both sides to weigh in on it. Mm -hmm. And so in this case, the majority, it was 10 out of 13 people agreed that there are concerns with electromagnetic exposure. And they wrote the majority report. We wrote the majority report. But then there were three individuals who said, well, we don't really agree with your findings. We're going to write our own report, the minority report. So that was three. And two of those three really had uh, close connections with industry. One of them was the representative from the cellular tele telecommunications uh, industry, the CTIA. And so she voted against our report and for hers. And then we had uh, somebody from the Business and Industries Association, and he also voted. He was on the minority report. And one of the senators, the state senators, voted with the minority. So it was just an opportunity for all both sides to, to have a say in why they came to the conclusions that they came to. Yeah, and I, I really appreciated the way that report was set up, because when you read the majority report, there were 10 out of 13 commissioners who signed that, right? And right. then you have the minority report, which three out of 13 signed. And for our municipalities, for our general public, for our legislatures, <clears throat> the minority report walks us through the perspective of the industry. So we get to see the industry playbook and we get to see what others investigated and concluded. So uh, I, think, I think it's a service to have both in there. Yeah. So I've heard the industry play down the science, calling it fringe. And in fact, after this report came out, you spoke with the Keene New Hampshire City Council because they're looking at uh, updating their local bylaws. And there was a third representative from industry there. I hadn't known of this gentleman before, but he got on and said, this is all fringe science. And you, in fact, investigated the sources of the science when you were on the commission. Can you help us understand whether this truly is fringe science or whether it's a huge body of evidence? Uh, it is, uh, I'm actually not exactly sure what a fringe journal is or fringe science, but everything that we looked at was in the mainstream of science. It may not be, the, the journals that we reported may not be uh, high uh, in terms of readership, the large numbers, but it does represent solid science. And you can check on all of the, any journal. So there are such things as junk journals and predatory journals where they allow almost anybody to publish, where they don't have quality people on their review boards, on their editorial boards, but you can check that pretty easily by looking at things like their impact factors, citation index, the acceptance rate. And so you can look through those. And we did that for, for many of the journals that reported bad, and negative effects as a result of exposure to radiation. So these are top-notch journals, and we can give examples of them if you're interested. Uh, that show that there are problems. So if you go to and you look at the credentials behind those journals, you'll find out that they are rock solid. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, and they're from people from name brand universities, if I can use that term, from recognized universities. So these are top-notch researchers who are reporting harm. And so, no, we didn't go out, you know, oh, by the way, I should note that there probably are some junk journals that report negative or positive things, mm -hmm. but we didn't use them. We do our best to identify good journals, and I can guarantee you that many, that most, the majority of journals that we referenced are re recognized and solid journals. That's fantastic. You know, the Italian courts did the same thing. There was somebody who had gotten some of the tumors and other health effects from their cell phone. And the Italian courts refused to let the industry funded studies be considered as they investigated. And at the end of the day, they ruled in favor of the poor person who wound up getting the glioblastomas or the acoustic neuromancer. 
So if you could walk us through for a few minutes, uh, perhaps some of the highlights of the scientific findings. Okay, well, there are many, and so these are not necessarily cherry-picked, but they are ones that do show, uh, the, the reveal the concerns. And these are the things, the types of, of publications that I came to in the very beginning that made me go, whoa, uh, there is a problem here. Yeah, because I know in the appendices of the study, some of the highlights that you speak of are cancer, infertility, uh, electromagnetic sensitivity, which our own government already recognizes through the Americans with Disabilities Act, and vulnerability on children and the environment. So here's an example. I, I could give you lots and lots of examples. So maybe let me know when you think you've had enough information. Okay. Here, here's just one of them. And what I've done here is I've taken the title of the article, and I have a quote from the article, and then I give the reference if anybody is interested in following up for this. So this is, uh, as you can read, the statement of the, or the article title is that low intensity microwave radiation induced oxidative stress, inflammatory response, and DNA damage in rat brains. Now these uh, is using a type of radiation that comes from a cell phone. So we're not talking about blasting a rat with, and putting them in a microwave oven. We're putting in low level mic or, uh, frequencies similar to what would be coming out of your cell phone and we're seeing DNA damage. That's of concern. Mm -hmm. And I'll just continue on here and give you a few more. Yeah. Dr. Chamberlain, on that last one, so I'm not a scientist, I'm not a medical professional, but when we talk about DNA damage, that's the roadmap to grow a proper anything, right? Be it a plant or a person or a font, you know, that's pretty serious if we're damaging the DNA. Absolutely. Um, and the other one that was mentioned was the oxidative stress, which I've learned from medical colleagues is a precursor to most chronic illnesses. So Dr. Cindy Russell, who founded Physicians for Safe Technology, she likens it to we are resting ourselves from the inside out when we have oxidative stress. That's, I think, pretty accurate. Yeah, uh, yeah and one thing that industry has said, the, the, the defend the, the use of cell phones, uh, unabridged, mm -hmm. is that there is not an identified mechanism, but in this one, it's, the mechanism has been pretty well identified and it involves things like oxidative stress. And that oxidative stress starts with the voltage-gated calcium channels being influenced and, and impacted by the electric fields from cell phones. So there are mechanisms that are clearly identified. Maybe more information is needed to flesh those out, but the mechanism has been identified. Oh, right. Uh, exposure to global system, mobile yeah, GSM, cellular phone, radio frequency, alters gene expression, proliferation, and morphology of human skin fibroblasts. Now, the reason I felt that was particularly important to show is it says that if you expose skin to radiation, it has an impact on skin fibroblasts, and that's the uh, a mechanism for growing more skin. It's part of the, the uh, collagen matrix. And so if you interfere with that, you're interfering with the skin. And the, the reason I felt it was particularly pertinent is that the 5G uses the higher frequencies. And the claim by industry was, well, that makes it safer because it only exposes the skin. Well, the skin is the largest organ in the body, and we certainly don't want to be influencing it. Or yeah, and well, I understand there are downstream effects. If you damage the skin, it's connected to all the other organs in the body. So right. it makes it easy for industry to say, oh, it's just the skin. But come on, it's our skin. And the eyes are another very vulnerable um, Absolutely. piece of our, yeah, so, yeah. So here's one that's uh, important because it uh, has to do with the, the way that these, the fields can influence you psychologically. And so as you can read right here, microwave frequency, electromagnetic fields produce widespread neuropsychiatric effects, including depression. And there's a whole long list that you can read here of other things, the related things that are impacted as a result of exposure. And one thing to note here is insomnia. So if you're a person listening to this and you have insomnia, try turning off your electronics or put your, your phone into uh, airplane mode before you go to sleep. And turn off your router. And turn off right? your router. 
And a lot of people have reported doing that and having very positive effects. Yeah, in my own family, I've seen that time and again with my loved ones. Uh, but I really appreciate that you shared this particular journal from uh, Journal of Chemical Neuroanatomy with Dr. Martin Paul, because our children are in crisis. 50% of the kids today have a chronic illness. And even before the pandemic, we were at epidemic proportions of anxiety, depression, and then there's a whole lot of suicidal ideation that our kids were never up against before. But we continue to pulse this microwave radiation at them. And one of the issues is that if we don't give our bodies a break, it just accumulates and we never get a chance to do proper cell repair and regeneration. So this is why I am so very grateful for this New Hampshire report because it is the first in the United States to actually look and do the deep dive with qualified people to assess the information that's out there. Right. So um, did the commission, well, our guidelines for public radiation exposure are set by the federal communications commission. So this comes from the top of the United States at our top agencies. Did the FCC come in and join you for this investigation? Well, no, they were invited, but they never showed up. And so what we did is we then provided them with some written questions, very specific, mm -hmm. along the lines of what you and I are talking about. And they only their response was to send us links to their website that did not answer those questions. So yes, they were invited. No, they never provided the information we asked for, nor did they show up to, to respond in person. Yeah, that is just such a bad sign. But there are good things happening in the background too. When they denied the signs and they had an opportunity, they had an open docket that would uh, invite the public and the scientific community to provide literature to see whether we need to reassess our FCC guidelines. And at the end of the day, the uh, FDA, Federal Food and Drug Administration, which commissioned that study with our own national toxicology program, they did a $30 million study that went on for decades that, as you mentioned, concluded clear evidence of cancer. Clear evidence is the highest category they can assign. Clear evidence of cancer is NDNA damage. And one might think that that would start the transition into public policy that would protect the public. But unfortunately, the gentleman who heads up that part of the FDA today is not the one who commissioned the study way back when. He's new. And he's married to somebody who is a partner in a law firm that represents industry. So he turned around to the, the FCC and said, no need to change those guidelines. And so they put that in the federal register that we're going to stick with these levels of exposure that we know the science is showing is very harmful and especially to children. And so once that hit the federal register, Dr. Deborah Davis's environmental health trust with Theodora Scarato and others, including the national resource defense council and others are suing the FCC along with the children's health defense. These lawsuits were combined. And so that is before the courts right now. And they, uh, subsequent to this report coming out, they actually had oral arguments at the end of January, 2021. And the judges were piecing it together. They have 11,000 pages of credible scientific study and testimony from the public, 11,000 pages in 27 volumes. And they're looking at this in the industry saying, oh, it's fine. <laughs> and so they said, well, Let's look at due diligence here. What did you actually do to prove that this is safe for the public? They said, well, the FDA told us it was safe. And they said, okay, so what did the FDA do to prove that this was safe? And so that's where it was left. And now the courts are going to rule hopefully over the next six months. So that's probably why the FDA and the FCC did not choose to participate in your investigative process because the wheels are sort of coming off the bus for the wireless industry. Well, um, I'm, I, I'm hoping you're correct. Uh, one piece of information that I'd like to share <laughs> that maybe explains, no, I think does explain yes. uh, what's going on. And this is something that we as a commission ran into fairly early on to, and because we were looking for an explanation to why isn't the FCC doing something about this when there's all that evidence of potential harm. 
So here's a report by uh, Harvard University, and the title of it alone says a lot. How the Federal Communications, or Captured Agency, how the Federal Communications Commission is dominated by the industries it presumably regulates. Mm -hmm. That says it all. And then here's a quote right from it, and that is, industry controls the FCC through a soup-to-nuts stranglehold that extends from a well-placed campaign of spending in Congress through its control of FCC's congressional oversight committees to its persistent agency lobbying. Yeah, I mean, they are strong. They've got such a foothold up at the federal level that that's why it's so critical that at the state level we do everything we can to inform and to protect our public. And that captured agency report was my missing piece. As I was studying this, right. you know, all on my own, as far back as 2012, 2013, I'm looking at the science going, you've got to be kidding me. How can you ignore this? And surely somebody's got our backs, right? So it wasn't until 2015 when Harvard published that captured agency report that I went, oh, nobody's <laughs> gonna fix this. So we've got to work, educate at the top, and work from the bottom as well and do everything in our power. And literally tonight, people can choose to hardwire their technology and control what they can control. Uh, but it goes much beyond that because we now have utility smart meters being mounted on our homes that pulse this microwave radiation 24 seven. And a lot of people get sick from those. And I know that your commission intended to study the smart meters, but when the pandemic hit, your government shut down for four months. And so the work that was going to be done to investigate the smart meters was set aside. And when you returned, uh, you had a consensus or a, a majority that said, we think we know enough. We still want to meet our November 1st, 2020 deadline on this commission report. So we're going to go ahead and start preparing that report. So smart meters are a big deal. Um, we also have other points that we can't control. The macro cell towers are the big cell towers with the big antennas that are mounted first on cell towers. And then they began to encroach closer to where we live and work. And if you could paint it the same color as the building, you were then given permission to put a cell in these giant cell powerful antennas on buildings if you could paint it to blend in with the environment. And then now we're up against the third major exposure so smart meters, macro cell antennas. And now we've got the industry fighting tooth and nail to put cell towers literally in people's front yards or backyards. So they are on top of us now. And literally there's something that will be coming out shortly. The Children's Health Defense is suing the FCC again because there's something at the federal level called the OTARD rule and OTARD stands for over the air reception device. So it used to be if you wanted to have a satellite dish to get good reception from what they were beaming down from satellites, you can put that on your house. And that's just between you and the satellite. The FCC and the industry have now changed the OTARD rule to allow for two-way transmitters from your rooftop or from your private property. And they have stripped local control. So they don't have to go before a zoning board or a planning board. They can go knock on your neighbor's door and say, hey, we'll give you free Wi-Fi. You'll have the best in the neighborhood if we can just put this little antenna up. And some are gonna be little antennas, some are gonna be big antennas. And you are going to put a hugely toxic exposure right on top of your property. And now you're gonna be the person in the neighborhood who's gonna blanket this constant pulse of microwave radiation. Right, and you know, if you are under the belief that cell phone radiation is totally innocuous, Mm -hmm. uh, this makes that would be great. Sure, come on in, put a tower in my backyard. You're going to be the hot kid on the block. Yeah, right. Th that would be great. But uh, it's and and that's a large part of what we're trying to do as a result of this commission, and that is to let people know, let you know, there are issues with cell phone radiation. Are there problem or can we resolve some of those problems? Absolutely, we can. You know, we, one thing we don't know yet. We know there's a risk, but we don't know the cost benefit, you know, trade off for that risk. Here's an example that I like to use. And that is, we know that there's a risk associated with driving a car, you know, about 35,000 people a year die on the on the highway. But we feel like that risk is worth worth it, because we want to drive our cars. So we're willing. Right. So, we'll so I can't there, Dr. Chamberlain, what I appreciate about that analogy is when you talk about driving a car or using a car, or walking down a street that has cars on it, 
you still have the right to choose. That is your right to decide if you want to get in a car or if you want to walk across the street that has cars going by. The huge difference here is they are stripping our right to choose. Absolutely. And that's one thing that we felt was really important on the commission. We want to provide the opportunity for people to opt out of exposure if they so choose, just like with a car. You can buy a safer car. You can use the, the safety equipment within it. Uh, but, but with cell phones, the way it's being proposed is you don't have any say-so whatsoever. Yeah, and if I could offer one example from right here in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. This is out in the Berkshires, a very bucolic community. It's not a wealthy community, but people live there because it's such a lovely, natural place to live. You know, Herman Melville's historical home is out there. And this um, community during the pandemic woke up one day and people were getting sick. This little girl came downstairs and says, mommy, my head really hurts and I feel just all buzzy inside. The mother got sick, both her daughters got sick, neighbors all over, more than a dozen in this neighborhood were getting sick. And the mom started researching and she found out that that day a cell tower was turned on. They had gotten a permit on this big empty parcel of land at the address at the front of the property. So that's where it was permitted for, but they want to maximize their space for buildability. So they put it on the back of the property, which abuts this neighborhood. And immediately people started getting violently ill. So this is what we're talking about. We need to restore our right to choose. And what I love about the New Hampshire majority report is that you folks came up with 15 recommendations for how to start educating the public and putting some common sense measures in place for having excellent technology. And again, the message is not no technology. We love it and we live by it, but it's high time we be given the facts and start taking proactive measures because the industry is fighting, like I said, tooth and nail right now, and they are forcing these toxic infrastructure sites inside our neighborhoods. So what did the commission come up with to help keep our, our communities safer? Well, I mean, it was a number of 15 recommendations. Some of the highlights are that we recognize that we're not getting help from Washington currently. The FCC is captive. So what can we do about it? We're not going to be doing it at the local level. We're not going to be doing it at the state level. So the only thing that we can do, and this is one of the recommendations, is ask that our fellow federal delegation, our federals and our senators and our Congress people to enact legislation at the federal level to pressure the FCC to reconsider the thresholds they've given. You know, only Japan has higher radiation thresholds than we do. So we need to relook at this. We need to reconsider our, and I'm sorry for going on in too great a detail about this, but I think it's important to hear some of the background. The FCC, or I should say the industry, pressured the FCC to come up with legislation in 1996. It's, uh, uh, Section 704 of the Telecommunications Act of 1996 says that you can't use health concerns as a reason to stop or change siting for cell towers. So that's already locked in place at the federal level, and we can't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. So how do you do something about it? Well, you ask your federal delegation to, to enact legislation to have this reinvestigated. And I think that if that happens right now, as, as CC pointed out earlier, I think that we can get something done. So that's one of the things. We also uh, su suggested or made the recommendation that we have a, a public education program going on, and that would involve uh, websites and other forms of letting the public know that these cell phones are not innocuous. There is a risk. You can control that risk. And so don't do things like pushing the phone right up to your ear. Don't tuck the, the cell phone in your bra or have it in your pocket less than five millimeters from you. So there are a lot of common sense things that can be done that we can put signage on cell phone towers or and on these towers that you may not even know you're next to a tower because they're blending them into the environment. Yeah, they're putting up a facade in front of it so you would never even know that you're living right underneath a cell tower and wondering why you don't sleep, why you feel anxious or depressed or you're vomiting or you know it hits the mast cells of the guts. It causes the blood to coagulate. That's true. Um, and glom together, that's the Rouleau effect. And 
we, you know, as you mentioned, the industry for years said there's no mechanism of harm identified. So keep doing what we're doing. But now we know at least eight mechanisms of harm. Mm -hmm. And so we know enough that we should have long ago taken advantage of the precautionary principle that says, even while the science is playing out, if there's enough to show there's something here, then we should stop and not resume until we have scientific evidence showing there is no harm. Absolutely. Um, And we also already have something in our own federal government that the Centers for Disease Control uses for ionizing radiation. And, you know, I've had to adopt a whole new vocabulary. I didn't know what any of this was, but apparently, and, and correct me on this, ionizing radiation is enough to break the atom. And that is um, applicable to sunlight. We would never leave ourselves or our children out in the sun 24 seven, right? Mm-hmm. Moderation. Um, and it also is why we wear a lead apron when we do an X-ray because we wanna protect from ionizing radiation. But up at the CDC, they have something called ALARA and the ALARA principle is to aim for as low as reasonably achievable. So they use that for the ionizing. So only use as much exposure, as little exposure as you need. And today we're like, woohoo, all Wi-Fi all the time. We've been on this honeymoon for- Seven, right. Oh, and, and the current standards, even though they were set in the 90s, don't include the additive effect of multiple radiation sources. If I have one cell phone here, it's going to give me a certain amount of radiation. If I put down another cell phone, I'll get twice the radiation. Or current- a classroom where you have, oh you know, gosh. now with this pandemic, we have given every student a mobile device with absolutely zero safety instruction. Teach them to plug it back into an ethernet cable. If they can't make sure they're at least, I think um, the Russians and Cyprus in their medical literature are telling families to be at least 16 feet from that router because distance is our friend. Although there is no safe level of radio frequency radiation in the scientific literature, distance definitely helps. And then only turn on those signals when you absolutely need them. Otherwise, download everything on your device and enjoy your entertainment once it's downloaded or um, download your applications that you need for school and only go live to upload and download and then go right back into airplane mode. So it's it's not rocket science, but who would know? And some of these things can be made automatic and seamless. That's what technology is for, is you now have identified a problem. How do we get around that problem in a way that's going to be at least intrusive and will satisfy the need? And the need in this case, I think, is to lower exposure. Right. And I know that when Dr. Timothy Sheckley spoke to you, he is the author of a document called Reinventing Wires, the Future of Landlines and Networks. It's a policy paper out of the Washington, D.C. National Institute for Science, Law and Public Policy. And the long term solution, which I see you guys have one of your recommendations, is to bring hardwired technology into the community via fiber optics or high-speed cable or copper and not stop in front of your house, but bring it right to your house. Because right now the industry is bringing that good technology down the middle of the road, but then they're throwing up all these wireless nodes with these small cells right in front of people's houses. So if we could skip all those small cells and bring it right to the house, then you just pick up inside the house with an ethernet cable. And if you have a lot of devices or a lot of people in your home, who knew you can get a little ethernet switch that allows you to plug in multiple ethernet cables to the back of your router. And then, you know, you can get little adapters. If you have an Android system or a Chromebook, there is a company out there. There's probably others. I just know this one called Pluggable. And you can actually plug in your cell phone or your Chromebook right to an ethernet cable with this little adapter. And if you use the Apple products, if you have, um, let's say a MacBook, there's this little Thunderbolt adapter that just plugs right in at the bottom to the ethernet cable that goes to your router. Same thing if you have an iPhone, who knew you can hardwire an iPhone, right? And anything that you're doing on the internet, you can go right through this. And for my own daughter, when I did this and I came home and set it up for her, 
She goes, wow, mom, it's so much faster. And the signal's a lot more reliable and your data is much safer oh, through a hardwired connection. Right, security. Right, and that's a huge issue. Um, and especially for our children, because the industry has really been persuasive at convincing our state level education authorities that wireless is the way to go. And it's a great revenue model for them, but it's horrible for our children. And in fact, uh, the New York Times did a series of articles on what Silicon Valley executives are doing, and they are sending their children to schools with no technology, not hardwired, not wireless but no technology and their nannies sign contracts that there will be no wireless or screens around their children. And yet they keep promoting all of this technology to our children. So I was so pleased if you could talk us through the recommendation that you have in there for schools. It's just that when you, as schools, uh, will start phasing out the wireless system. So, uh, and this happens, you know, that periodically the equipment goes bad or new technologies become available. But as that happens, we're asking that you go wired as opposed to wireless. We're also looking at Li-Fi, uh, which is where you use light modulation as opposed to electromagnetic waves mm -hmm. to provide the signal. And Li-Fi is very fast, it's reliable, uh, but right now we need to make sure that it too is safe before we really recommend it. So yeah, some... because one of the mechanisms of harms that we have with the microwave or the radio frequency radiation is that in the wee hours of darkness at night as part of our circadian rhythm, the pineal gland in the brain is meant to release melatonin and melatonin does a couple of important things. One, it helps to regulate our sleep cycle. So think about it. If we've got this pulsing all night, it sure explains why so many people, adults and children, don't sleep well anymore. And two, it helps to the melatonin helps to escort the toxins through our bloodstream and out of our body. So if we've got a light energy source on and going all night, it dysregulates our own body's ability to do that natural sleep modulation and clean up and repair. So I would love to see studies done with Li-Fi or if it turns out to be a much better technology, put the education around it. When you're sleeping, don't have it anywhere near you. Right. Don't have it pulsing through your house, through the walls or the floors or the ceilings. Because right now these wireless routers carry all the way out to the curb sometimes. So, you know, when you turn on your cell phone and you see that you're getting, you know, 15 network options from you and your neighbors, that means that radiation is your living space right now. So we just, I'm so grateful for the education campaign that you have in this report because you're talking about radio ads, television ads, information published on state websites. Um, so not just, oh, if somebody's interested, you can find information here, but get the information to our community. You know, it's important to do that because if you think it's innocuous, you'll use it as you've always used it, you know, holding it up to your head, tucking it in your bra or doing other things, you know, having it close to your body. And we know that it causes a problem. Right. And, and you know, we are seeing a doubling and quadrupling of colon and rectal cancers. We are seeing right. breast cancers in men and women. Um, and if I could mention another reason why I am just so proud of the work your commission did in New Hampshire is you actually looked at the peer reviewed non-industry funded science. You had representation from many important areas who are qualified to evaluate this. And you did the deep dive into the science. And one of the things that I've heard the industry say since your report came out, and in fact, they said this in the uh, Keene City Council meeting that you attended, that, oh, this is just one report. There are other states who have done an investigation. And they, they all said, you know, there's really no problem here. Can you help us distinguish between the work you and your commission did and what some of these other states did? Well, I don't think they did a really deep dive. They didn't come up with it a real commission. In some cases, they would bring in somebody like an industry provided presenter saying there's no problem and they would believe it because, you know, confirmational bias, you want to think that 5G is going to work because it does offer opportunities. Mm -hmm. And so some of the cases that I'm aware of, they didn't do a deep dive. They simply accepted what industry said and ran with it. Now, 
something that looks pretty promising is the state of New York is now forming a commission mm -hmm. to look at the same type of thing and we'll be in touch with them. And the one thing I can say with confidence is that anybody with an open mind that knows how to interpret scientific information will come to the conclusion that we did. And that is there are problems with exposure. We don't know the degree of that exposure, the, the, the risk yet, but we know that there's a problem and we need to identify what that problem is, how, how much of a problem it is before we just roll, start rolling it out on a, 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 to everybody. So- Yeah, and it is, there are people literally waking up with one of these small cells That's right. literally in their yard and they had no information on it. They were not informed that it was coming. Nobody talked them through the risks and it's just showing up. Um, and I was so honored to be asked to present at the recent Electromagnetic Fields Medical Conference 2021 in January. And we hear from medical doctors who are saying, Oftentimes, one of the major triggers for people to become sick from this is when smart utility meters go in on their homes or when a cell tower gets turned on near where they live or where one of these small cell antennas show up. And so they are seeing a, a clear increase as the exposure increases in our community. So we just hope to help get word out to everybody that what, what people can do is protect themselves with everything that's under their control. Um, I've helped to fund or to fan, well fund, I, you know, we all dug into our family pockets and formed a nonprofit out of Europe called Wireless Education. People can go out there and take a course for a half an hour online. You'll get the science, you'll get the risk, you'll get the medical recommendations, and you'll print out a tip sheet at the end that teaches you reminders, you know, don't sleep with anything on, always choose hardwired if you can. So there is off the shelf training already for our communities. Um, but we have doctors, nurses, first responders being trained now. And all that training is going to become available online very soon. The, the videos from the lectures at the conference are being you know, packaged appropriately to do online training. So we have that for the medical community. Dr. Paul Haru up at McGill University already has academic modules that he teaches. Dr. Magda Havas up at Trent University also has academic modules that she taught. Um, so we have the technology, we have the education, uh, but what we need to do is safeguard our communities. And so there is a group called 5GCrisis.com, which actually took the bill from New Hampshire and um, rolled in some other best practices from around the nation. So we could take that state by state to our legislatures and say, hey, this looks like something we should be paying attention to. Here's a template. Let's start with that and see what works in our state. And then what the folks at 5gcrisis.com did is they also took best practices at the community level and said, who's got good bylaws in their town? Who's already codified it in their laws to protect the communities. And for example, in Keene, New Hampshire, where you were asked to give public comment recently, um, they are now reassessing their town bylaws on wireless communication facilities. And if you go out to 5gcrisis.com, they've got a checklist of things that you might wanna consider putting into your town's bylaws. Things like uh, suggest a 1500 foot setback from residential areas because in the scientific literature where they've studied what happens when cell towers with, are within 500 meters or about 1,640 feet, it shows increases in cancer. It shows increases in insomnia, in the mental illnesses and so forth. Um, so ask to get a setback from your neighborhood, from your communities. Uh, the industry is stripping local control with these 5G small cells. So take it as far as you can within the law to have distance between how far apart can these poles be with these constantly pulsing microwave transmitters on them. So there's a lot that we can do, even though the industry did put in that section 704 of the Telecom Act that you can't claim any environmental harm. And as you said, they've since defined that to include health issues. Um, but as far as the environment goes, what does the New Hampshire report do to address the biological impact on all the other living cells on our planet? 
Well, it, it does show, and we have a report that I could bring up, uh, but for brevity, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll just say it. And that is that exposure to electromagnetic fields does harm vegetation. They've done a, there's a paper out that has a study where they looked at the trees and vegetation around cell towers. Mm -hmm. And they're finding that on the inside, what starts off is a degradation in health, starts off on the side that's being exposed and then works around to the entire tree. And so this is a very carefully done controlled study, you know, with a you know, control group when they looked at the health of vegetation. And then in other studies, they've looked, oh, so th there's not just one study, there are multiple studies mm -hmm. that have shown this and they're showing an impact on insects Certainly insecticides do cause a problem, but that when coupled with exposure to electromagnetic radiation makes the problem all the worse. So we look at those things and, in, and if you have radiation that is impacting trees and insects and, and other wildlife, mm -hmm. clearly it's not something that we wanna just allow to go unregulated. So right. that is what we found and that's part of our recommendation too, is we wanna pursue the environmental impact of exposure to fields. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate that um, you have the one recommendation for the federal delegation, you know, our congressmen, our senators, to get our public radiation exposure limits addressed for humans. But you also are asking them to do the NEPA review and get the Environmental Protection Act in on this, too, because we can't keep destroying our pollinators. You know, it's bad enough we do that, but we rely on them. And one of the um, interesting takeaways from the scientific literature is that our bees, our birds, they have a natural navigation system that is meant to be in synchronicity with the Earth's electromagnetic field. And now that we've in introduced this huge layer of electrosmog, it's dysregulating their navigation system so they can't get back to the hives. And now that we're introducing these millimeter waves, which are tiny for 5G, it adds on to all the other stuff, but these will overpower our insects entirely. These millimeter waves are the same size as their poor little bodies. So we have got to do something and do something quickly. So with that, can you help us explain, You know, and I know that our legislative processes are not meant to be quick because we want them to have legs under them for things that will stick through proper due diligence. So, so the fact that we've had legislature on the books in Massachusetts for eight or 10 years, and we have yet to get anything completely converted to law. The fact that New Hampshire wrote this bill with representative Abrami, it was co, he, and as you mentioned, he was a Republican. It was co-sponsored by a Democrat. Um, Dr. Tom Sherman, who's a medical doctor. And then it went to the House Committee on Science, Technology and Energy. They reported it out favorably. It then went to the Senate side for health and human services. So we had both the health and the technology and engineering side of it. They both reported it out favorably. And then your governor Sununu signed it into law. And this all happened in seven months time. Yep. So it was almost miraculous because we have never seen a legislature do what we all thought they would do when you bring this information to your elected <laughs> officials. It was, and you know, you I didn't know anything about this. I thought I would raise my hand and say, we've got a problem and our elected officials would take the ball and run with it. But mm -hmm. time and again, I have seen that is not the way most of our systems work. And so I am so grateful that New Hampshire system seems to be working in the best interest of the public. And I read a really lovely interview that Governor Sununu had done. And he said, our job bottom line is the health and safety of New Hampshire. Yeah. So now that he has been given this report as of November 1st, today we're now what four going on five months out and granted we've had a pandemic, we've mm -hmm. had the holidays, um, and just we are not in normal times. So what do we think is going to happen with this report? And how soon do we think we might see New Hampshire citizens benefiting from the recommendations in this report? Well, I think it'll take a little bit longer than the initial legislation, House Bill 522, to get something actually done. But legislation is being written as we speak to act on the recommendations that we made. But you can imagine that the telecom industry is going to be fighting this. 
mm-hmm. and business interests because they're right now saying there is absolutely no problem and no reason not to or to to hinder the rollout of 5G. Mm-hmm. So I think this one's going to be more of an uphill uh, battle, legislative battle, than the original legislation. Oh, no kidding. Yes, but but it is being written, and uh, it, I think, will be completed reasonably soon. It'll then be discussed, and we'll have to just wait and see. Mm-hmm. It may be that it, it'll be torn apart, the, the legislation, so that only certain parts will go through. But like I say, only time will tell. Yeah, but, you know, if I could make a recommendation, is that people don't wait because the industry is fighting so hard to put another toxic layer of infrastructure in because these lawsuits are happening at the federal level and they know it. So don't wait for higher authorities. Do your own investigation. If you like to do the deep dive, go on to the New Hampshire website and uh, Dr. Chamberlain will provide the link for that. But this report is just so incredible. And it's full of links. So if you get the electronic copy, you can just drill down and do your own investigation. Um, my One of my girlfriends said, Cease, I just want the bottom line. What's the bottom line? Safe technology, not hard to do. Hardwire your technology, turn it all off when you're not using it and don't let it be your playground. Remember to get back outside. You know, I just <laughs> recently collaborated with uh, Dr. Carrie Crofton up in Canada And she has a program that she's starting to roll out called uh, Less Screen, More Green. And it's true. We all used to be outside doing a lot more. And before the pandemic, you never even saw kids outside playing anymore. I read an article where in Taekwondo and karate classes, they have to back up and get the kids to strengthen their abdomens because they're not outside running around. They're not climbing trees anymore. And their bodies are physically not strong in many cases. So we need to come from the pendulum where we're all Wi-Fi all the time and we're all in front of our screens all the time to what is good technology, what is safe and what is common sense and get back to living our lives and not being at the beck and call of that next hit off of our devices. All right. Okay. So if there are resources we can share, I would suggest 5gcrisis.com to go out and start today working with your communities. And it takes a lot of courage, but nobody's going to fix your town unless somebody brings it to your town. So 5gcrisis.com, the Environmental Health Trust has just this incredible database of information. Um, And then our little nonprofit, wirelesseducation.com or .org, where you can take a schools and families course, or if you wanna train your workforce, there's a corporate course that literally anybody can take and learn in about a half an hour online, so. We need to link link this information below. So just check on that and uh, pick the ones that may be most appropriate for you. Yeah, but maybe start tonight by creating a sleep sanctuary and just see, we see children's behavior issues calm way down after just a few days. There are pediatricians who put their Uh, families on a 12 hour a night detox. And they have had children uh, with de novo mutations on the autism spectrum, meaning they didn't get the autism from mom or dad's genes, but it's something in the environment. They've had children who were nonverbal actually speak. This one kid said like, hey, mom, can you hand me the, and they, they all just went, what? Nobody had ever heard that child speak, let alone the child. And that's after they turned off the Wi-Fi? Yeah, they did a 12-hour detox. Dr. Toral Jelter out in Walnut Creek, California has a protocol that is used. And, you know, we're all biologically very different. So it's going to be different in every body. But in my family, we've had headaches resolve. We've had nosebleeds resolve. We've had insomnia resolve um, just simply by turning it off at night. So that's a, a a highly recommended first step strategy. Mm -hmm. And we'll have that EMF medical conference training. It offers continuing medical education for doctors, for nurses, for first responders. So this is a great time to join the conversation because we do have so many tools that we didn't even have sights on when I fell down the rabbit hole in 2012. So, yeah. So thank you and thank you to your colleagues on the commission. And we hope to see good things continue to make their way through New Hampshire that the rest of the country can lean into and do in our own communities.
Well, stay tuned. And if there are any updates, we'll put it in the link below so that you can click on it and find out where things stand. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Chamberlain, for your service and for your open heart to want to help our world in this most incredible way. Well, thank you for the opportunity to speak about the findings of the commission. I, I hope it does some good. All righty.